you. Uh, Welcome. <laughs> My name is Michael Clark. I am the director of the Portland Center for Public Humanities. I'm a professor in the Department of English here. Uh, and this is our first event of this uh, fall season. Uh, and we're very happy to be able to host uh, this panel on Welsh literature and Welsh authorship and, and questions surrounding it. Um, <coughs> I um, am not here to talk for more than just a few moments to say hello, uh, I'll tell you what the Humanities Center does. We basically are hosts for any kind of humanities related events. Someone just asked me what are the humanities and I said, is there anything that's involved in the study of the human condition? Art, literature, music, philosophy, history, so many ways to think about what the humanities is and are. It's a tough one because it's plural and <laughs> it's hard to know how to quite get that right. In any case, uh, welcome. Um, and uh, I have passed around a little uh, sign-up sheet for those of you willing to share contact information. Um, because we like to keep databases up that we, if we have another event, we have a lot of events coming up this fall. And uh, you're all welcome to join at any time. The one thing about the Corbin Center for Public Humanities is all of our events are free and open to the public. And that's important. That's one of our missions. And, uh, we're going to stick with that one to the very end. <laughs> so, um, with no further ado, therefore, I'd like to hand things off to Carrie Ameriki. Uh, Ameriki Cumbri. Ameriki Cumbri, I left out there. I knew I, I, I left my sheet, my sheet sheet there. Mm -hmm. and, and he will uh, introduce our evening's events and speakers. Mm -hmm. Thank, you. Thank you very much, Michael. You're up to a warm welcome from uh, Portland State University. And I'd like to amplify that and uh, wish everybody a very warm welcome. Uh, Corso from Ameriki Cumbri. And uh, I will be mercifully brief, uh, because I know that uh, people want to get on with the program tonight, uh, just to give you a, a, a quick outline, outline or rundown of what we'll be doing. We are going to ask the uh, Oregon Welsh Festival Choir to step up to the front in just a moment. And they, under the uh, direction of uh, Owen Hoffman Jones, will be performing the Welsh National Anthem, which we hope you'll sing along with. Don't worry if you can't, uh, it is infected. <laughs> and uh, also, uh, they will be performing uh, Eli Jenkins' prayer. I think that's correct. That's correct. Right. Yeah. Uh, then we will be asking Dr. Tracy Prince to give a presentation on her book, uh, Culture Wars in uh, British Literature, or Other Voices in British Literature. And we will then hand over to our panel. Uh, we have uh, four authors here tonight. Uh, from Wales, or three from Wales, and one from Pendleton in Oregon, who specializes in writing on uh, medieval Welsh uh, history. And we'll be putting the question to them, what is it that makes Welsh literature, Welsh writing, uh, special or unique? And why should we really be considering uh, either amplifying the amount of Welsh writing that is taught in English uh, classes in American universities, or perhaps even presenting it as a separate course or module. That's the topic of our discussion. And our writers will be speaking to that and also uh, exemplifying their points with reference to their own writings. They will probably give short readings as well, at least in the case of uh, our three Welsh authors. That will, be, that will be the case. And there will be a Q&A session at the end of the evening. So, without any further ado, I will ask uh, Owen Hoffman Jones to please lead us in the Welsh National Anthem and the Oregon Welsh Festival Choir. The primary thing we do is uh, we, we sing at the uh, annual Gaman Bagani, which is the, the annual hymn singing festival that is held every year on the fourth Sunday in June uh, in Bryn Zion, at Bryn Zion Welsh Church in Beaver Creek, Oregon. Um, so our, our main mission really is to promote this, uh, the annual hymn singing festival. Uh, Welsh hymns, well, Welsh has a, a the, there, there is a there is a strong culture of Welsh hymn singing uh, and hymn writing and a celebration of of the glorious hymns that have, that are part of that culture. Um, come come on the fourth Sunday in June to Bryn Zion and experience it. It's definitely worth uh, worth coming. So for our first piece, we'll be uh, singing uh, <coughs> the Eli Jenkins prayer. It's it's a text written by Dylan Thomas.
and every evening at sundown I ask a blessing on the town for whether we last the night or no I'm sure is always touch and Holy, bad, or good, who live our lives under milk wood, and thou, I know, will be the first to see our best side, not our worst. Oh, Stand, please rise. <laughs> please rise. <laughs> Join in. My head, Thank you very much, uh, Owen Hoffman Smith and the Oregon Welsh Festival Chorus. And I'd like, without any further ado, to call our. Uh, <laughs> 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 okay, Owen Hoffman Smith. Thank you very much. Uh, Owen Hoffman Smith and the Oregon Welsh Festival Chorus. And I'd like, without any further ado, to call our panelists to the front, please. Uh, right. <laughs> Chris Carl is a little late, but he will be here in plenty of time. And the first item on our agenda is the uh, keynote uh, address uh, from Dr. Tracy Prince of uh, Auburn State University on her book, uh, Culture Wars, Other Voices in British Literature. So, okay, can everybody hear me okay? All right. Um, so uh, my book, Culture Wars in British Literature, uh, focuses on multicultural issues and national identity in the t uh, last hundred years of British literature. And um, I look at a lot of um, the questions about why Welsh literature isn't taught as much as it should be. Um, I argue that 
Um, British literature is more than Anglo-English literature, despite the way it's depicted by London literary elite and anthologies. Um, so the quick rundown on the chapters, uh, the imploded empire, I look at how dramatically the sense of national identity has changed in 100 years from the empire upon which the sun never set to a dramatically diminished feeling of empire. Uh, chapter two, the difficulty defining uh, British literature, so who gets to be included, who's excluded, why. Uh, the difficulty defining black British, um, and we'll talk more about that, but it's um, a term that came to mean all people of color in Britain. Uh, Two Nations looks at class issues of, of a chapter on British Jewish writers and xenophobia and the Booker Prize and Britain's new multicultural identity. So in all of these anthologies here on the screen, um, I won't go into details, I, I critique them in the book, but they do a very poor job of doing anything other than teaching Anglo-English and largely dead white male writers. Um, so um, that is something that you couldn't get away with in teaching American literature. I've taught American and British literature for 20 years at different universities in North America. And you wouldn't ever teach that um, American literature that way. Um, but it's still pretty much the way British literature is taught. And there is a real gun shyness towards the idea of being too PC or too um, uh, multicultural. So first I'm going to show you the problems with how Welsh literature is left out of the teaching of British literature. And then we'll discuss whether and how to change that. So once you see the problem with, with the way it is today. So the first chapter goes from Rudyard Kipling, the beginning of the 20th century, who was called the singer of imperialism and wrote adventure and children's stories and kind of ends up around Zadie Smith, who writes about the multicultural Britain she grew up in and takes completely for granted and is shocked when people keep asking her why she's writing about people like that. And she says, I'm just writing about the people I know. Why is that so shocking? So um, I uh, found this fascinating quote by, um, and this is the, in the chapter, Difficulty Defining British Literature. And this editor from Granta, John Freeman, he says, American writers are constantly engaged with the question of being American. And the, the, the argument goes on to basically say, and British writers aren't engaged with the idea of being British. They're more concerned with the aesthetics of the text. And my argument is, that British literature gives us many clues about who's included, who's excluded, who gets to be counted as British, who doesn't get to be counted. It's quite, the subtext is quite clear, um, even when the authors wouldn't even imagine themselves writing about the idea of British nationalism and, who, and uh, a, a sort of cohesive British identity. So one of my most glaring examples that I give of this is A.S. Byatt, who is um, a really, really important um, uh, English author, and Oxford University Press went to her and said, can you please put together a short story of, uh, short stories in England. And she put together, she ethnically cleansed literature in England, and nobody noticed. And <laughs> that was shocking to me. Um, she even explained that to me this is so shocking. How could you even say this? How would, why would you even think this is okay to say? She explained her editorial criteria as selecting writers with pure English national credentials. How, how do you get away with doing that and not be called a racist? You know, but because she's so esteemed, um, the only people that I read, and I read as many uh, reviews of this anthology as I could, both when it came out and in later years, it's been reprinted over and over and over again. The only people who noticed were a, a British Jewish critic and a black British critic. And that was so shocking to me, but it also is very telling for the state of British literature today. Hanif Qureshi, who was born in London, um, says that it's time for the white British to deal with the idea that there's a new way to be, of being British after all this time. So um, just to give you little glimpses throughout this process. Malcolm Bradbury, in this book right here, The Modern British Novel, He's talking about the 1980s and 90s, and he described it as a time when British fiction grew ever less British since it was beginning to reflect a variety of nationalities and a multiplicity of different Englishness. 
with a familiar notion of Englishness um, ending and calling the end of the century of British fiction fragmentary, pluralistic, multicultural, and depthless. So I find it equally as amazing that he would find the addition of non-Anglo-English people into the can, the literary canon, so shocking and so disconcerting. Um, it, it's, it led me to really question how this, you know, how this came to be, who, who, who decides who gets to be included, how do anthologies get put together, and you'll find that that's, they're, they're put together with a pretty um, uh, um, uh, non-multicultural uh, glimpse of the world. Um, I love Gary Young's work. He writes a column for The Guardian and in several other places. Um, but this book in particular is very cool uh, because to me, I was born in the South, so I study black British writing. I'm, I was constantly infused with this idea of you know, the civil rights movement in the South and have studied a lot about that and taught it when I teach um, African American literature. So to me, it all came together in this book because he talks about being a black British writer and yet having this um, dis detached sense of what that meant. And he took um, a, a bus through the South and did the Path of the Freedom Rides. And he taught himself, you know, and went through the, the points of the American Civil Rights Movement. And, and it was, it's just an amazing book. But in this book he talks about, he says, I never learned one thing about black British history or cu culture at school. It was entirely possible to go through school in Stevenage and not know that black people existed at all, other than the few you saw on television or around town, let alone that they had been in Britain for centuries. There was not one word that would have located me in the country in which I was born, not one scrap of information. This chasm in my education was thanks largely to the collective and selective myopia that Britain has about its place in world history. Tracy Walters, who is a black British um, writer and academic who teaches in the US, she says, as a child, I was not exposed to black British literature. In school, we read no books written by black authors, and I did not question this. In fact, I never really thought about blacks writing books. Additionally, I did not define other people, uh, other black people as essentially British. Most of my elders and playmates were Caribbean immigrants, and so I was taught to celebrate the achievements of great Jamaican heroes such, such as Marcus Garvey and Bob Marley. Outside of these individuals and some sports figures, I was unaware that blacks in Britain had contributed to the culture in important ways. And then you have the problem with anthologies lumping in Irish writers, and this was a fascinating moment in anthology, the politics of, of putting together a literary canon. And Seamus Haney uh, was furious. He, this was about the seventh or eighth, I think, anthologies that hit Brit uh, anthology that had the word British in the title that included his work. And he, yet, for some reason, this, this time it made him furious. And so he wrote this poem, an open letter, be advised my passport's green, no glass of ours was ever raised to toast the queen. He didn't want to be put in a British literature anthology. And then we have Professor Jane Aaron writing in Postcolonial Wales um, that when many people throughout Britain hear someone referring to themselves as British, this is often understood as coming from someone who is English. And the quote is, in today's Britain, the default position for those who identify or are identified as British only with no qualifiers remains an unexamined English cultural identity. So we look at what happens with the devolution of parliamentary procedures from, from London as the seat of government to devolve for Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland. And those parliamentary procedures have al allowed the processes, like what would happen at the state level, to happen back home. So I find it fascinating that a 2003 survey um, looks at how people identify themselves. In England, 38% as English, 48% as British. In Scotland, 72% as Scottish, 20% as British. And in Wales, 60% as Welsh, 27% as British. And you'll see a later survey um, in a little bit. And this is a great book by Maureen Duffy, um, England, The Making of Myth from Stonehenge to Albert Square. Um, just a fascinating quote, Scotland and, and Wales have no difficulty with their myth, myths. They have several hundred years of opposition and reluctant integration in which to polish them. We, the English, on the other hand, had always believed deep down 
that the Union was indissoluble, that the Scots and Welsh didn't really mean it in spite of the example of Ireland. <laughs> now devolution has actually happened and they have assemblies, flags, control over their own affairs. We feel aggrieved, abandoned, and find it hard to accept the outcome of what we have done. We have always regarded our Confederates as children, as we did the rest of the empire, even though they are historically our predecessors. So I'm giving you just little glimpses of sort of the, the cultural issues that are surrounding why Welsh literature might not be taught much in British literature anthologies. Welsh poet who um, R.S. Thomas, who is a son of a sea captain, says, Britishness is a mask. Beneath it, there is only one nation, England. And Britain does not exist for me. It is an abstraction forced on the Welsh people. And then he, he, while he chafed at the domination of a British identity over Welsh identity, he also chafed at the Welsh people whom he saw as being lazy, indifferent, or snobbish when they chose to speak English instead of Welsh. Deidre Madden from Northern Ireland often deals with how the religious and political turmoils of Northern Ireland affect average hardworking rural, uh, rural families. In Scotland, James Kelman uses Glaswegian dialect in his novels. Um, and he says that he identifies with African and Asian writers from the former British Empire since they too had English shoved down their throats. Calling Scotland an occupied country, he sees the imposition of standard English as a colonial oppression. In the chapter Defining Black British, it's a very complicated story of why every person of color came to be called Black British. And in some, time, in some ways, it was taken on purposely as a collective uh, um, political identity. The Empire Strikes Back is a really important book in this process. Um, the general feeling was that whether people were called blacks, browns, coloreds, darks, nignogs, or packies, there was little difference in the point being made. And collective action against such pervasive racism was thought a more pol powerful political force than many separate efforts. Pratiba Parmar, whose work I love, um, the most commercially available one is, is uh, Nina's Heavenly Delights. Um, I was spat at, called a packy and a wog, and told to go back to your country. The black British term united us in a frail alliance against racism, since we experience British institutional racism in very similar ways. And Hanif Qureshi says, two of us were officially black, though truly I was more beige than anything. So I thought that was fascinating. Salman Rushdie's Midnight's Children, he talks about the chutnification of history, which I love. And the post-colonial pr protagonist, one of the 1,001 children born in the first hour of India's independence, searches out an identity for himself among the debris of a partitioned India and a dwindling empire. And ultimately, he finds that his whole history and the history of both countries will have to be absorbed to achieve the proper pickling that this chutnification process demands. Who, what am I? I am the sum total of everything that went before me of all I have seen and done, of everything done to me, to understand me, you'll have to swallow a world. So um, I want to emphasize that I, I don't tell you that I have answers in the book. I just lay out all the problems. So I take the easy way out. I don't go, and this is the way to solve this. So, um, so um, also in that chapter, I talk about some really fascinating Welsh connections with the civil rights movement in America. Really, really cool stuff. So for example, loved hearing the choir, was there, um, I always forget what it's called, when the fourth Sunday. Um, but anyway, I was there, and I, it was magical. And I, I, I recommend that you all go. The, the idea of uh, Welsh singing being a way to have solace and to connect with the most oppressed, there was a huge connection with Paul Robeson and has continued even today uh, that I talk about in the book. And then I talk about this incredible, um, it's a civil rights attraction in, in the South, and it's called the Welsh Window. And when the four little girls died in Birmingham with the KKK bombing of the church, an outpouring of, of concern and solidarity um, spread throughout Wales, and they collected money and built this, what is called the Welsh stained glass window. And it was very significant that in the middle of the civil rights movement, when, when people were being dehumanized, that they pictured a black Jesus. So there, that whole story is in the book. I, I didn't want to go through all of that now. But um, Welsh writer Charlotte Williams looks at a different kind of Britishness. And she uh, talks about her upbringing in Wales by a Welsh-speaking white mother and a black Guyanese father in Sugar and Slate. She talks about when she was in 
Guiana, she had uh, been thought of as British, but then back in Wales, um, she had to um, find her connections between her African and Welsh history. Um, Leonora Brito, who passed away in 2007, lived in Cardiff. And this is from a very important, um, though now ending, um, way of life for the Cardiff Docklands, where um, uh, Tiger Bay, the Docklands, her neighborhood was known for its migrant communities of 40 different countries who, for more than a century, had been attracted by work at this busy harbor. In the last half of the 20th century, the area was filled with decrepit buildings uh, because of the decline of the coal industry and related decline of the harbor. And in a 1999 redevelopment scheme, um, all of this was bulldozed and was renamed Cardiff Bay. So her books tell the lost, that lost story. Jack Tan, who is a British artist and, he, and a lecturer at the Royal College of Art, he, this is a great quote. He lists the aspects of British society which seem to be non-essential. Important British features such as Scotland, young people, Islam, the inner city, and ethnic minority communities. He sees these subjective visions of Britishness as strongly held and continually reinforced in an effective strategy of reinforcing what one considers to be essential by identifying the non-essential and then rejecting it. In my chapter on British Jewish writers, I covered the pogroms in Wales as, as well as throughout the, um, the rest of Britain and the long, long history of British people, uh, sometimes called the oldest ethnic minority in, um, in Britain, the Jewish people. And Danny, and I know I'm going to butcher the, the last name. How, how would I pronounce? I don't... Absi. Absi. Yeah. Um, so he was born in Cardiff, and he writes about um, this in Goodbye 20th Century and in Ash on a Young Man's Sleeve. And I find this poem um, really interesting. He writes about um, in, uh, his encounter with a patient um, in London. And he uh, says, the, the patient, the, the poem, most Welshmen are worthless, an inferior breed, doctor. He did not know I was Welsh. Then he praised the architects of the German death camps, did not know I was a Jew. So I thought that was an interesting commentary on that. This is a, I just, I don't know why, but I'm just really attracted to this. I think because of the different languages. It's, this is an old abandoned synagogue that's now an office building with great internet access. This is what they advertise on online. But I just love the story of that in you know the, the, the old Jewish community there. You can see the Hebrew around the arch. There's Welsh in the picture as well as English. It just to me it tell, that tells quite a lot. So in the chapter Xenophobia and the Booker Prize, um, I look at what I call the homegrown versus the exotic. And as you'll see, uh, they make this very clear, who is homegrown and who isn't. Um, literary cri critic Merritt Mo Mosley declared the selection process uh, for the 1994 Booker Prize um, flawed by its eagerness to be politically correct and to select multicultural rather than English entries. The selection and award process for the UK's Booker Prize for novels is cumbersome, biased against English entries. The novels reflect a multicultural background that, while politically correct, did not include native non-minority British authors, meaning white Anglo authors. Um, and some other pretty provocative comments that um, I, I just thought I'd gather to let you see. Pat Barker who wrote The Ghost Road and, and won for 1995 for the Booker Prize, made provocative comments which reveal a lot about Britain's culture wars. I think She said, I think there's a certain amount of unacknowledged resentment among white native British writers on the grounds that the additional tinge of exoticism when it comes to the Booker Prize does a writer no harm at all. She pronounces that she, it's difficult to say in a way that does not sound racist but there's a sort of resentment that the Booker judges are so obviously straining to be unparochial and exotic. The homegrown English novel is really rather undervalued now. Um, I find it fascinating that she uh, presents the Anglo-English writer as the underdog. And, <laughs> and look at how we have to fight and scrap and, and get, our, get some attention on for the Booker Prize. That's pretty uh, shocking, I think. Um, this would be Pretty, a big surprise to Welsh writers who find it difficult to get on the Booker radar. A.S. Byatt, 
expressed um, in indignation over the left-wing political correctness in this country, which she sees as unfairly privileging the Empire Strikes Back authors. Bayek calls total rubbish any notions that English, the English novel has become more daring or more interesting with the addition of books by, quote, these people from elsewhere. Um, she calls the Empire Strikes Back, Back a myth, and she said, all these writers were in place, writing away. Sorry. Um, they're all English, they're all white. It doesn't seem to me that anything Rushdie does is anything more interesting technically than what they do, although it's not less interesting. Um, and then in the post-colonial exotic, uh, marketing the margins, British academic Graham Huggin blames the media, the Booker Prize, and the post-colonial literary establishment for this focus on the exotic. He argues that post-colonial writers, academic critics, the Booker Prize, and publishers are at fault because they market exotic imperialist nostalgia. Of course, one look at the definition of the countries eligible for the Booker Prize refutes this premise. America was just added this year, but it wasn't in there before. Since this prize is an award for Commonwealth and Irish writers, the percentage of British, and more specifically, Anglo-English writers represented on short list and long list is embarrassingly high. And in, in fact, 20th and 21st century novels by and about Anglo-England are being read in disproportionate numbers around the world in places where Anglo-English experiences seem exotic to people who have few points of reference with this culture. The only way those Anglo-English novels are sold to people whose lives bear no resemblance to the lives in the novels is through marketing, and especially through marketing of imperialist literary nostalgia. Thus, instead of arguing that the Booker is overly concerned with so-called exotic novels, the argument is easily made that there's a great big world of eligible writers who, over the life of the Booker Prize, have been ignored in favor of mostly Anglo-English writers. So I look at how the, the talk surrounding who's considered exotic, who's considered homegrown, um, and how a lot of times this is very unconscious, this people who don't consider themselves making inflammatory statements, but uh, I hope you begin to see that the subtext, where the subtext is taking us. Um, I thought this was an amazing <laughs> um, article. Sorry. So, um, this, I cannot, this Irish name, and can anybody do, do, do I've got a, a Fiacra, Fiacra Gibbons. Um, See, says, speaking proper is not enough. A Booker judge must have the right Regency residence to go with it. It was as if the Booker had imposed an accent test so that they might not be threatened by barbarous tongues from beyond the moat of the M25, which surrounds London. I may have got this all horribly wrong, of course. No doubt the judges have concealed um, you spent digging coal with teaspoons in the Welsh valleys or working the checkouts on the dawn shift at... I'm going to butcher this again. There we go. <laughs> but that is not what it looked like and sounded like to me or anyone else cringing at home who craved just the merest acknowledgement that someone outside the Worcester and Brahmin caste of literary London might read a book or know good writing when they saw it. So just to show you where uh, Welsh writing falls within some of this. In the 2012 Edinburgh Inter International Book Festival, Scottish author Irvine Welsh described the Booker Prize as highly imperialist oriented and argued that the prize's claims of being in inclusive and non-discriminatory could be uh, demolished by anybody with even a rudimentary grasp of sixth form sociology. So here's some um, Welsh writers who have been acknowledged by the Booker Prize and I thought I'd just go quickly over them and um, uh, you know there I think that that argument could easily be made that there need to be more in the list. So Bernice Rubens was born to a father who had escaped anti-Semitism in Lithuania and a mother whose family had fled the same thing from Poland. Timothy Moe, born in Hong Kong to a white Welsh-English mom and a Cantonese dad, moved to England at 10. A Chinese-Welsh writer, Peter Ho Davies, raised in England but spent his summers in Wales. Sarah Walters, uh, born in Nyland and, her, and uh, has written a, a number of books that have been incredibly well received. And uh, born in Cardiff, Tre I'm going to butcher the name, Treza Azopardi, Azo Party, um, shortlisted for the Booker Prize, and writes about an immigrant Maltese family. Um, 
So getting towards the end, as, we, as my uh, argument was that it isn't exactly a new multicultural identity, but that's how it's being treated, uh, this acceptance of a new multicultural identity in Britain. Um, uh, several writers have talked about how this book by Linda Coley, uh, Britain's Forging the Nation, um, was incredibly well received because people were attracted to this idea that you could blend and that historically people had blended a British identity on top of a Scottish or Welsh or Irish identity. And she made a good case for this and it did appeal to people. And I say, intriguingly, in 2011, the UK census asked for the first time, how would you describe your national identity? English, Scottish, Welsh, Northern Irish, British, or other. And here is the census from um, 2011. I wanted you to focus on Wales, so the dark um, is English, this paler color is Welsh, and then this color is British, and this is all other. Um, just to give you a sense of how people are starting to identify themselves um, when given the choice on a census record. So with um, the, in 2002, with the Queen's Jubilee, um, it, it prompted the BBC to do a survey, what makes you British? And they ask people to respond online. And so I picked out a number of uh, people commenting, and one of the m striking ones I found was a man from Scotland responding that he's Scottish and has never considered himself British. My views on what it means to be British will be the same as many from Scotland, Wales, and Ireland, that being British equals being English. He wonders what there is to be proud of when British achievements tend to focus on English achievements. This is the Queen's speech in 2002 at her 50th anniversary celebration, the Golden Jubilee. And many people considered it quite significant because in her speech, um, she talked about Britain being a multicultural and multi-faith country. And Jason Cowley was a Booker judge in 97. He was also an editor at Granta and is now at New Statesman. I just like this quote to finish it up. Um, he described um, the changes that he saw to British literature and he observed that in the past decade, um, as movements away from introversion, nostalgia, being enthralled to the past, so many books that he read as a Booker judge were essentially costume or historical dramas. He wondered where the energy was that he saw all around him. Where were the novels that told us how it felt to be alive right here and now in Britain at the end of the 20th century? So I wanted to end with that. And um, just to ask, you know, if, if these are the problems with getting British literature to include um, the entire, um, uh, all four nations of the United Kingdom, then is, what is, is, is the answer to try to encourage more Welsh literature being taught separately? And I thought we could talk to some of the folks on the panel about that. Uh, one of the things I wanted to comment on is that I find it most interesting the people who question their Britishness. And I think teaching this idea of Britishness that is complicated and confusing and has conflict is so much more interesting um, than uh, pretending that conflict doesn't exist. And the conflict is there in spades, but um, uh, that's what I would like to see. Um, I've taught um, English in several different countries, and um, I, I, it's hard to get students to come into a British literature class. Um, it, it's becoming less popular than it was back in the days the, where they could pack entire lecture halls. People are le less um, attracted to that. So that, that's the only question I have about splitting it off, is would it, would it draw people away? But anyway, I wanted to present you with the problems, and then we can have everybody else come up with the other stuff. Thank you. <laughs> well, I'd uh, like to thank uh, Dr. Tracy Prince on behalf of the Mayor Academy and on behalf of the audience and uh, our other panelists, I'm sure, for that fascinating and illuminating discussion. And I think a number of points uh, were raised that are extremely relevant uh, 
uh, to, to and uh, supporting all our question, should write Welsh writing and English be taught as a separate course or module in US universities? And I'm going to move on and uh, put a question to our panelists. Basically, I am going to ask uh, each panelist in turn to answer the question, if uh, Welsh writing and English were to be taught in American universities, what might students expect? What do we have to offer that is in any way special or unique? What might be said to distinguish Welsh writing from writing that uh, uh, it's basically produced a couple of miles down the road, the other side of office <laughs> done. That's the question. What do we have to offer? And I'd like to uh, take this opportunity to introduce our panelists. Firstly, uh, Dr. Sarah Woodbury, and I'll need to put my glasses on here because I can read from this and uh, can't do that without them. And uh, she is the author of 15 historical novels set in Wales, and I believe the most recent one was published uh, uh, about a week ago, um, yep. Castaways in Time, yep. and the After Kilmeri series. And uh, she makes a home in Pendleton in Oregon. And Sarah went to the University of Cambridge and Brimlock College as a PhD in anthropology from the University of Washington and sold 150,000 novels to date. And so uh, and I'm going to give the panelists uh, the opportunity to uh, give supporting readings from their books as well, if they wish. But that's not essential. So uh, each panelist will have 10 minutes on that question. Uh, Sarah, we'll bring over to you. Yep. Um, should I? Is it on? Is it on? Is it on? Oh, it's yeah, on. Fine. All right. Good. Okay. Well, um, so to begin, just to say that, that I do write fiction, I tell stories, and this question of, of should Welsh literature be taught as something separate from English literature it, within an academic setting is relevant in a sense to me, who is no, no longer in academia, simply because it would make my job a lot easier. Um, I don't know, um, preaching to the choir, I suspect, because there are Welsh people here and people interested in Wales, but in general, in writing fiction, historical fiction, my novels are set, all of them, in medieval Wales. And when I speak to a general audience about writing books set in medieval Wales, a huge percentage, maybe 90%, look at me with this blank expression because they're putting an H in between the W and the A. <laughs> and, and you can see them say, medieval Wales. <laughs> And, and really, so that's the beginning, and particularly because as an American writing uh, books set in medieval Wales, uh, published here in America, in the UK as well, but on a much smaller scale for the most part, and, and my interaction is primarily with Americans, that the idea that as someone who writes medieval literature, you have common ground with your readers isn't necessarily true when you write about Wales. It has a very different cultural, linguistic, historical tradition. And in a sense, what Tracy talked about for the 20th and 21st century, what, what I write about and deal with is the historical origins of what we see today in terms of Wales as its own separate entity. So, what I see more in dealing with writing about Wales, writing about medieval Wales, is not so much stereotype and prejudice as just sheer ignorance, that it even has a separate cultural background, historical background, the language is impenetrable to English speakers, as I am attempting to learn Welsh, and it's difficult, you know? I mean, I think all of those things when from a reader who has watched the Tudors, has read Ken Follett and Philippa Gregory, and then comes to novels set in 1143 at the time of King Owain of Gwynedd. Their expectations come with all those English historical understandings, which on, on a certain level have, have very little to do with what is happening in Wales historically at the time. And in part, my job as a fiction writer is to educate at the same time that I am telling 
a good story. And, and on a certain level, there's, there's a limit to that, simply because nobody knows, you all do, but nobody knows anything about whales. And it's one of those things, if I can just give a brief example, um, a reader posted a less than favorable review of one of my books that said that the, one of the main characters of one of my books said in 1143 um, at the court in Gwyneth is Prince Huel, who is the illegitimate son of the king. And he is an heir to his father's kingdom. His older brother, Finn, is the firstborn, but those two are both princes, and they are illegitimate. And that did not matter in medieval Wales. A, a child who was illegitimate could inherit equally with legitimate children. People who know medieval Wales know this. Nobody else does. And so when your main character has this, this premise to them, on some level you have to, to inform as well as tell the story. And, and the challenge is not to let that history get in the way of telling the story and, and making what is essentially unfamiliar familiar. Because we know within English historical fiction that illegitimate children are a big thing, you know, and they don't inherit. I mean, oh, I could go on because there's, there's lots of it. But for those who have read English literature, um, the Welsh history is something that's that's very different. Um, you know, another example is the Prince of Wales, our wonderful Prince, uh, I guess it's Charles at the moment, William is his son. And, and when Edward I conquered Wales in 1282, in 1284 his son was born at Carnarvon deliberately so that he would be a Prince of Wales to prevent any native Prince of Wales from ever claiming the throne again didn't quite happen. But that's why the Prince of Wales is the son of the King of England. It's nothing to do with Wales. It was because they conquered Wales and he wanted that right to go to the throne of England from then on. But it's those kinds of things that make me look at an issue like this where there's the 750 years of misunderstanding essentially between England and Wales and, and the frustration that I have encountered it at times among English people or, or this sense of, of being British and why being Scottish and Irish and Welsh and English all together in a sort of a happy family is not necessarily shared by the Welsh. Um, and, and, and that, that complication um, you know, it's ongoing. It's, it's, it's 750 years later, and people are like, it was 1282. You know, why are you guys still upset about this? And they are. We, we, <laughs> we were, my husband and I visited, um, we're fortunate enough to spend a couple of weeks in Wales in May and June of last year. And we visited during the time of the Queen's sil silver, was that what it was? Silver Jubilee? It was in oh, June 5th. 2012. Um, so this is her 60th year of her reign, and they were doing a big celebration in the pouring rain at Krakow. And, and, and simultaneously, not, the Olympic flag came through, banger, when we were there. And the conversation, even here 700 years later, among the Welsh that we were staying with, was how all along that route or at the Queen's coronation, it was the Welsh flag that was being shown predominantly. This is in, in North Wales, uh, not, the British, not the English flag or the British flag or, or whatever. I mean, there's this, this delineation that is going on in the minds of many Welsh people to this day. And, and to that sense, the, the notion that if British literature could really encompass all of these other people, cultures, nations that the English conquered, maybe that would be one thing. Um, the fact that it doesn't, the fact that, that the Welsh and the Scottish and the, the Irish 
have this continuing strong sense of identity leads one to think that, that Welsh literature, Welsh history, Welsh culture as a separate entity makes a lot of sense. It's not the same. And, and with, acad with an academia, um, and I'm an anthropologist, not an, an English um, professor, but within that, th there's, there's this sense that a, there's a lot to be gained by um, teaching Welsh separately, Welsh literature separately. Thank you, sir. Yep. Thank you. Uh, moving on to our next panelist, uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Bill Rowlands. Uh, who was a primary head teacher in uh, the Rampa for 27 years. Uh, upon retiring, he devoted himself to writing and produced his first novella, which you can buy from our stall at the back of the room. I uh, thought I'd plug it for you there, Phil. Uh, a Christmas Carol Revisited, and an excellent read it is too. And it was uh, given its first public reading in Manhattan last December. And uh, Phil is also our partner in crime on the uh, Eto Venture, which is an American uh, venture uh, in conjunction with Phil Rollins, uh, and it's uh, basically an anthology of Welsh and American Welsh writing, biannual at the moment, and the next edition will be out in October, uh, shortly, in the next few weeks. So, all to you, Phil. Okay, thanks, Kay. Uh, is that okay? Can everybody hear me or, or not? Yep, is it on? Is it on? Yeah, okay, yeah. Uh, well, thanks, guys. Just, just, to, just to be honest and upfront from the start, I'm not on the same level as these guys, you know. They, they're, they're proper authors. Um, <laughs> I, I, I predom predominantly I write children's stuff, although I am branching out a bit, and it's only over the last year that I've really done it. But something you were saying, was, uh, on, on my gesture, we've got the three feathers, the symbol of, uh, you know, of, of perhaps, <laughs> perhaps oppression, because it's interesting to note that. Um, the very term Welsh is actually a derivative of the Anglo-Saxon, which meant from the word Wilas, uh, which meant stranger. So mm -hmm. when the, the Anglo-Saxons and Jutes were coming into the country and pushing their way further west, the Britons would, you know, Wales is, is as much as a history about geography as I think it is about people as well, because the geography defines the people, but especially in my case, from where I come from, the Rhondda Valley. Uh, they pushed us for the West, and we called ourselves the Cymru, the Fellowship. Hence, you know, when Kerry started the site, it was a Mary Cymru. He wanted people in America to understand more about Wales and what being Welsh was. And I think there's a huge sense of frustration among us Welsh people because we've lived next to our neighbours. Every year we play with rugby, and we've done that down good hiding, I have to say that. You know, they hate us because we beat them every year. No, not, hate, not hate as they hate. But, um, there's a, there's a sense of that frustration because we are so different. We were to live next to this big neighbor, and we are so different from them, and yet we get lumped with them all the time. Um, going back to the business of geography, where I live, it's, it's, it's a valley, uh, and historically, uh, the school I was in was, was built on, on, on the valley sides. And You can look through the school window, and there's a mountain which isn't just... You know, looks within touching distance because it's a narrow valley and on the top of this mountain is a, is a hill fort and you can still see the, uh, where the, where the circular ramp where the ramparts were, the, the trees go around, you can still see the shape. Uh, it was probably the Siluri tribe who, 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 who lived there, they were quite a fierce tribe, lived in that part of, of uh, South East Wales and, and gave the Romans an awful lot of trouble apparently. And down in our local church, a little local church where I took the chair one day, I was interested to note that over, over the archway there are two gargoyles. And one of these gargoyles has a tongue sticking out, and one doesn't. So the church is called St. Devadu. So I asked the, the, the vicar, you know, what's all this about? Well, he said, um, the gargoyle with the tongue was St. Devadu. And apparently he went around preaching Christianity. Apparently the Ron the Buck in uh, those days wasn't a very safe place to, to preach Christianity because the local chieftain took objection and had his tongue ripped out. So the other uh, picture of, of, of Gargoyle is of St. Devaluk without his, without his tongue. <laughs> um, so all around, all around, you know, you can see uh, where our history is. And we were, looking, we were looking at some gravestones and we came across a very unusual name in a Welsh graves, graveyard. It was called John Williams. Um, okay. It's interesting because uh, uh, took, we did this project, took some children down to Cardiff for the Frank Hennessy show and uh, uh, they said they found the grave with John Williams and they were, they were you know, 
three graves with John Williams on. So they said to the children, well, what, you know, what does that mean to you? What have you deduced from that? Well, they said he was buried in three different places. <laughs> so obviously he'd done something very terrible. He'd been hanged, drawn, and thirded. But uh, anyway, we looked, at, we looked at this gravestone, and he was born in 1815. Uh, he's born in Cowbridge. He served in the lifeguards for 25 years, a student at the time with Dickens, and you know, when all that was going on, we read the novels of Dickens. Uh, and he came back to the valley, married me, was up there, no record of his wife on the, on the gravestone, came back home, and he was killed in um, a locomotive accident in, in 1865. And that spans a lot of history. It's a history that doesn't impact on Wales, it impacted on the world, because uh, when coal was discovered in the Rhondda Valley, um, it became a very industrialized area. It grew from a little uh, place that had 1,000 people to uh, 170,000 people at its peak in a very short space of time. It was a bit like the Klondike, you know, very, very similar, that kind of growth and people coming in um, from all over. It was, some people call it, the cradle of the Industrial Revolution. Uh, and, and a lot of, it was where Richard Trevithick, who was a Cornishman actually, um, he, it was a subject of a bet between two coal owners, Richard Crochet, who was uh, from Bertha, uh, and uh, Samuel Humphrey, uh, and they had a bet. And one said, I bet you couldn't take a load of coal from Penadaran to Abercannon by, by steam. And they had this bet, big wager. Richard Trevithick, Cornishman, invented this, this steam train, did the business. He actually steps back into obscurity. He wasn't much of an entrepreneur because uh, Robert Stevenson then took it on and uh, uh, went further with it. But that was the, st the start of the Industrial Revolution. The impact of that was to change the world. Uh, for us Welsh people and for the people living in the Rhondda Valley, uh, it meant that you know we, we, we were very much, I suppose, uh, my grandfather was a miner, um, and you asked well, what, would, what, di what different things would, 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 would a, uh, sort of uh, we bring as Welsh people to, to literature. Well, the Rhondda Valley in particular, and the, the Welsh Valley is where Mike comes from, the, there's a black sardonic almost kind of humour, because people lived with death every day. It was a, it was a fact of life. My, uh, my wife's father, he served in the, in the First World War, got through it, won a medal, so on and so on. Next thing she knew, he was being brought home on a, on, a, on a door, an old door, as a stretcher, because he'd been killed in, in a fall. It wasn't a major thing. It was one of those things that happened every day. He'd been killed. Didn't look as if there was any mark on him, just been crushed. Uh, the other side of the coin is the Sting End of the Disaster, where 400 and, I think it was 470 people, there was hardly a person in the village who wasn't affected by it. So this was the kind of environment that, that, that perhaps my generation still have a link to. My grandfather was a miner, um, and when he closed the pit, he was an entrepreneur. He, uh, not, not when he closed the pit, when he had it finished because of, of dust, um, he opened a barber shop. Uh, and his buddies, as we used to call them, came down from the colliery and had the haircut. And it was a very basic, short back and sides, you know. If you went in and asked for a Tony Curtis, you were in trouble, you know. <laughs> <laughs> on your way, right, you know, that kind of thing. But, uh, so we have a very uh, distinct identity. And, and you mentioned about Paul Robeson, who is a bit of a legend in the valley, because at the time, you know, we were a very oppressed people. The Tonopandi riots, which took place where I live in, in uh, back in the turn of the century, we were a, a watershed in the trademark movement, uh, trademark, tr uh, trade union movement, and probably uh, the low point in Sir Winston Churchill's career, because uh, he always said afterwards, I never sent the troops in, but actually he did, only on the first occasion he, he checked it out and s he said, oh, we'll have to stop them when they got so far, but later on as, as the riots got worse and situation deteriorated. There was an awful lot of violence. They drafted police in from everywhere. Um, they were sent in. And one great Welsh writer, I hope you, you've heard of him, he's my favourite actually, Gwyn Thomas, who, who, who's got such, he's got such humour um, and writes about, uh, about the Wales and the valleys, but writes, although he writes with a tremendous humour, underpitted it all is this, this rage, this anger all the time. And I can understand where it comes from, because you know, I've seen my grandfather uh, hardly able to walk because his dust has clogged his lungs. My uncle, I watched him literally spitting his lungs up in, in, in his bed. He said, this is no, and this is just a fact. Um, and he writes with this tremendous humour, yet beneath it all is this, tr is this rage, you know. Going back to what you said, uh, you know, about, about um, uh, Paul Robeson, we, we revere him really because he was prepared to, uh, he was a star. 
but you, you know, I remember first time you don't remember Paul Robeson, but what a voice the man had. He was a star, Hollywood star, wonderful man. And he came and identified himself with us at times when, you know, we, we were, people were, were, st were starving, it was, uh, there were difficult times. He actually went on the mic, he made a film, I think, mm -hmm. um, which appears, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, he it it makes, it makes a film. Um, so, so we bring a totally different perspective. And although I, I'm speaking perhaps in a na narrow sense of, of, of Welsh but I'm just speaking of where I come from because everybody who's Welsh has a different perspective of what being Welsh is. But it's certainly a very different perspective of, of being Welsh than, uh, than somebody who is English. Now, I've, I've gone on perhaps a bit longer than I should have. Uh, one thing I want to do, I would love to do, is the old powerhouse in Tarapani, which was, which was, the, um, it was the place where, where you where the engines were driven, they kept the, the mines clear of water. And during the strike, what the colliery owners did, they told, they, they kept the, the horses underground. And then they, they, they put the story out that the miners, these awful, terrible people who were rioting, had refused to bring the horses up. And that if they didn't, if the, if the pumps weren't allowed to work, then the horses would be, would be, you know, be killed. The king was, was appalled, everyone was appalled. A terrible treatment of horses, you know what we, you know what we British are like with our uh, love of uh, love of animals. Um, so th that was a, that was a, 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 a lot of propaganda. But this building is still there and it's falling into disrepair. But my vision is, and a lot of people have this vision, one day we'll use it uh, and we'll we rebuild it and and well, and we'll turn it into somewhere we can start regenerating. Uh, a community that is in desperate need of regeneration. You know, I, I, I can't wonder into that because I'm involved in something with that as well. But I'd like to, like to read you a poem, perhaps, uh, before I finish. I know I've gone on a, a long time. It's a poem that, that was written in, in phases, really. Um, I did a lot of work with children in school and local history and getting them to understand their identity. We do a lot of drama and uh, we used to enter competitions. We used to beat schools from all over, over the country. I've got to say that, you know, I'm not, not posting, but that's a fact. Because Welsh kids from the valleys are as talented as, as any kids anywhere. So th this poem is, is like in three stanzas. It's not too long. It's a uh, great grandfather song, grandfather song, and father song. And the first stanza is sort of about um, about the drovers, you know, who, who the Welsh cowboys. They existed for hundreds of years, but then with, when with the coming of steam, they disappeared overnight. So I hope I can remember because. The, Lord, the road is long and winding that leads to London town, but though the way be long and hard, upon it I'll be found. So do not fear you farmers to leave within our care, the sheep and cows you know by name, are tenderly you rare, for though our tongues be coarse and wild, our manners with the sheep are mild. On secret paths we travel, above the wildcat's lair, the crystal streams flow silver down barren mountains bare. Above our heads the red kites cry, and watch with avaricious eye, dark shapes against an azure sky. At night our mattress is the earth upon the land that gave us birth, and only God and nature dumb can mark the way that we have come. And we want to do gra grandfather songs. The village master taught us about Egypt and the slaves, and I, I thought I saw some sadness in his eyes, but we were young and full of tricks, not concerned about the sticks, nor were Arabs but their mummies when they died. Soon school passed away as dreams fade in the day, and off we went to work down in the mine. Great it was to feel like men when your oldest friend was ten and you knew that you were following the line. So we dug down in the soil, scraping pennies for our toil, but our laughter could not compensate our sorrow. As coldness filled our lungs and our wives bore us most sons, we knew there was no changing our tomorrow. My old teacher's long since dead, still his words live in my head. How our masters would not fear us from the Nile. We were marked as slaves from birth when they found coal in our earth and our enemies were avarice and guile. And the last one, which strangely took me the long, <laughs> the shortest to write, but I uh, felt closest to it, is called Father Song. Uh, they closed my old pit yesterday, I heard my father say, no future in it anymore, too high a price to pay. They found gas in the North Sea, we not need it anymore. A way of life is changing, boy, we've all been shown the door. He stood there on the picket line, his features drawn and thin, and when the black legs turned up, he refused to let them in. Your day is dead and over, the politicians cried, and sent police to beat him down, but still, he would not die. It was dust that took him in the end, the working miners curse. It clogged his lungs and stole his breath and laid him in the earth. And as we sang the hymns he loved and 
gathered around to pray, I knew there was still one thing they could never take away. I felt it all around me and I saw it in men's eyes. I heard it in their voices, in every heartfelt sigh. The spirit of a people, fierce, proud and strong. And that, that will be my song. So that's my, my interpretation of Wales and that's where I come from. And yes, we can bring something different and we will. Yeah. <laughs> Give them a the chance. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that, Bill. And uh, moving along, uh, I'd like to welcome uh, to the panel, or, uh, to the audience, uh, Mike Jenkins. Now, Mike is a poet, short story writer, and novelist, former teacher at a comprehensive school level for nearly 30 years, and is now a full-time writer and available for readings and workshops at any time. Well, as you can see, this, this has been prepared for with the UK in <coughs> uh, But anyway, Mike has lived in uh, Merthyr for over 30 years and was winner of an Eric Gregory Award in 1979 and the Welsh Arts Council Young Writers Prize in 1984. Also won the John Tripp Award for Spoken Poetry and the 1998 Wales Book of the Year English section for Wanting to Belong, Sarah in 2000. A book of intellect stories for teenagers. He was also a runner-up in Academy's 2009 Reese Davis Short Story Competition, and is also a former editor of Poetry Wales, and has co-edited Red Poets magazine for many years. Uh, his latest novella, The Fugitives 3 Cinnamon Press, centers on three young people in a South Wales Valley's escape, whose stories intertwine, and who despite the odds refuse to live lives of quiet desperation. Uh, so, uh, also, uh, they were skipping that this doesn't quite follow in sequence. But also, a Mike painter, Michael Castellius Payne, have recently been successful in an application to the Arts Council of Wales to tour a body of work across Wales in 2011 2012. The exhibition, uh, which was then being developed, is, was called Dim Gawaith Canary, meaning no hope like a canary, exploring ideas inspired by traditional Welsh idioms and phrases. And Mike's latest book, which is actually your latest book, I'm, I'm really pleased, yes, slightly it's disjointed, it's <laughs> yes, and which we have at the back, uh, is called Barking. It's a collection of poems and short stories published by Karen Guac. And uh, one um, uh, excellent story from that book also appears in uh, issue one of Eto, by kind permission of the author. Mike Jenkins, over to you. OK. Uh, OK, you hear me? Yeah? Yeah, everybody? Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm really better at reading things than talking about things. So I'm going to keep this quite brief. Uh, in, you know, addressing should Welsh writing in English be taught as a separate course? Uh, uh, no, uh, because I believe that uh, it should be Welsh literature. Um, and here, here's why, basically. I've written it down because I'm hopeless at our living. Uh, I think we're a, a small and proud nation uh, with literature dating back to oral tradition of mythology and the Mabinogion. Uh, through to David Ap Gwilin, uh, a great writer about love and lust as well. Uh, and then in the 20th century, uh, Gwenacht and Waldo Williams, both pacifist poets who were imprisoned because of their beliefs. Uh, we're a nation which crowns and enthrones bards and prose writers in annual festivals, I said Vodai. Today, I think we're a vibrant nation despite our relative poverty. Uh, English and Welsh literature coexist, interrelate, and largely stimulate each other. I do, I do try, and I've just started writing in Welsh. Try to, you know, learning Welsh, try, try to write. Uh, in a bilingual country, pushing for more powers uh, for its Senate. I've got an interest here, my daughter's a politician in the Senate uh, for Plaid Cymru. Uh, many writers are committed to their place, their community, and its history in both languages. Uh, interesting development, you have a, a number of poets and prose writers, uh, for example, John Gower, who was here, uh, a couple of years ago, maybe? Yeah, John Gower, who, who writes in both uh, Welsh and English, and there's an increasing, I'm, I'm actually trying to get an anthology together of learner's poetry uh, in Welsh. I don't know whether it'll happen, I've got to get 100 poems, but I'm some way there, anyway. Um, okay, um, many are also committed, uh, I believe, more, more so than any other country, including Ireland, to uh, politics. Uh, an example of this would be uh, Red Poets, which have been, been going for 19 years, uh, so we get a collection. We do get uh, poetry from the States as well. Uh, my friend uh, David Lloyd, who I mentioned later, has had poems in here. Um, we have writers who, in all genres who belong on the world stage. I don't think we need to see us, uh, you know, the Booker Prize <coughs> as, as the aim. We, we, need to, we need literature which is, which is uh, you know, proud to be on the world stage, not necessarily looking to England all the time, which we have done in the past. 
so it's happening already and Professor David Lloyd, my friend, I was staying with him uh, uh, last week uh, at Lemoyne College in Syracuse, uh, whose parents were Welsh, came over to uh, New York State, has taught a course, uh, just as I would, I would envisage, relating the Mabinogion to the modern day, Welsh literature in translation and in English. Uh, we're a country, I believe, re rediscovering itself, yet reaching out to the world. Uh, universities here should be part of that energy uh, and that kind of zest that we call Hoyle. Okay? I'd like to read uh, a few poems just to, uh, as an example. Uh, one is um, a poem that goes back uh, quite, a, quite a while, uh, and it's about the Aberfan disaster of uh, 1966. Um, most people, I don't know if anybody's not familiar with it, but it was a huge uh, slag heap, basically, which fell on Pantclass School, uh, de demolished the school totally. Many, many children died, many uh, teachers, also people in the houses near that. Uh, it's called, He Loved Light, Freedom and Animals. So this was the inscription on one of the graves. No grave could contain him. He will always be young in the classroom, waving an answer like a greeting. Buried alive, alive he is by the river, skimming stones down the path of the sun. When the tumour on the hillside burst and the black blood of coal drowned him, he ran forever with his sheepdog, leaping for sticks, tumbling together in wind-blown abandon. I gulped back tears because of a notion of manliness. After the October rain, the slag heap sagged its greedy coal owner's belly. He drew a picture of a wren, his favorite bird for frailty and determination. His eyes gleamed as gorse flowers do now above the village. His scream was stopped mid-flight. Black and blemished with the hill's sickness he must have been, like a child collier dragged out of one of Butte's mines, a limp statistic. There he is, climbing a tree, mimicking an ape, calling up names at classmates, laughs springing down the slope. My wife hears them, her eyes attuned as a ewes in lambing, and I try to foster the inscription away from its stubborn stone. Okay. Uh, I'll just give you a little bit of, um, I've written three books in, in Merthyr dialect, and this is the third one, Barking. Uh, the cover is by the Merthyr artist, uh, uh, Gus Payne, you mentioned. And this is an example of um, an incident in, in Merthyr, it's writ, uh, all, all written in dialect. Uh, it's called Setting Fire to Tesco's. It's an incident I missed, unfortunately. <laughs> Tesco's being a supermarket in Merthyr. Setting Fire to Tesco's. Change of mood now. All right, I was off of my head on drugs and booze. The day I set fire to Tesco's, the day it rained in Tesco's, I tried to burn off a taxi to scurry through a security. When all hell let loose, you'd have thought I was a terrorist. I'd done nicking before mine, got away with it loads of times. But I was sober and clean then, knew what I was doing. Alarms began to ring, like the panic awaking. Sprinklers began spraying water over everything. Me and some of the staff was choking with the fumes. They soon cast hold of me, my head a waltzer spinning. I was lifting clothes, that's all, because I can't afford none. Half my benefit goes to a dealer, and the rest is just for surviving. What hope for the likes of me when there's fuck all opportunities? Sirens blaring all over a town, their message going, going down. Okay, finish off with uh, one from more music, which is more uh, about my family and about music, uh, kind of music, different kinds of music I'm into, uh, and about characters as well. And this is a character who lived down the road from me. Kutch is a word. Uh, which is used a lot in Wales. Uh, it can mean to it uh, to embrace somebody. Also, kutch down downstairs, which is like a cupboard. But uh, this fella kind of used it in a different context, as a kutch or watercress, bunch of watercress. I never heard it in that context. So this is green car. He's got a metro. He never drives it. It's got weeds for wheels. He's got tomatoes. He's got strawberries. They grow inside the car. He always waters. He always watches his greenhouse car. He's got a carrier. It's a white carrier. The only bag he takes. He fetches watercress for his sandwiches from the land out back. It is a kutch, he says. A kutch of watercress. This is his breakfast. He leaves by fences. He jumps over fences. Never along the drive. He stares at his bar. Stares at his garden. They're overgrown. He's got a metro. He wouldn't sell it. It's filling up with green. His name is Eric. He was a postman. He delivers leaves. <laughs> <laughs> Oh.
Well, thank you very much, Mike, for that uh, excellent and spirited reading. <laughs> and uh, move straight on to our final uh, panelist. Uh, I would like to welcome Chris Kyle, who is a novelist and uh, part time university lecturer, who has worked also as a sheep farmer, a journalist, and a tour guide in a number of European cities. Uh, in academic life, he's published and lectured widely on traumatic memory and representations of the Holocaust, and currently teaches at the University of Wales. He has held literary residencies, workshops, and master classes in Europe and the United States. He is the author of the French thing, uh, Caraguay, 2002, which I believe uh, you'll be reading from tonight. Mm -hmm. uh, Liminal, Alchemy, 2007, and Flirting at the Funeral, his current book, uh, Killian Press, 2012, which is available uh, once again from the bookstore at the back of the room. Uh, Floating is a story about love, money, and lost opportunities set against a background of global crisis, terrorism, and the power of the super rich. In 2013, Chris has appeared at uh, literary festivals in Galway at the Hay Literature Festival, and in October, and in October, uh, in fact tomorrow, uh, will be <laughs> appearing at the uh, Woodstock Festival, where he will be giving uh, a workshop on sex. sex. And the serious novel. Sex and the serious novel, ladies and gentlemen. So, mm -hmm. who could possibly miss that? That's tomorrow at Woodstock. At what time, Chris? Uh, that's at four thirty. But I'm also doing an author appearance at two o'clock, with um, famous Portland author Chelsea Kane. So that should be fun. <coughs> um, I would want to echo something that Phil said about. Um, it seems to me that Welsh writing in English is not a monolith; it's a continuum from writers who very specifically address uh, Welsh issues, issues of, of place and identity, all the way through to writers perhaps more like myself who, um, un, un, whose subject matter and um, thematic matter is, is not limited to Wales, but whose writing I think is informed by Welshness because there are absolutely profound cultural and social differences between um, Wales and England, which is something that's not always recognized by the English. But I thought that maybe the best thing I could do is read a little bit from um, my first novel, The French Thing, which does rather directly address that issue, those issues of Welshness and Englishness. Um, and it also allows me to um, let a character speak for me and um, speak more aggressively than I would dream of doing. <laughs> <laughs> um, to give you just a little bit of background uh, to this scene, um, this book is, is, has become a sort of historical novel, really, set in the uh, 1990s. It's a very small chapter of history, but Wales is a very small country. It's a novel largely about sheep, which I feel is appropriate because there are three times as many sheep in uh, Wales as there are people. And the background is that in the 1990s, Welsh farmers and livestock dealers started selling lambs in France, but shipping them over live in lorries uh, on um, channel ferries to French farmers. And it was a very nice deal. It suited everybody. But, uh, protest movement very rapidly uh, grew up to protest against this trade, which was felt to be inhumane and cruel, and um, tempers ran very, very high. There were, there were frequent, very intense, very often violent confrontations between the two sides, which makes it very interesting to, to write about. And by and large, the farmers and the livestock dealers were Welsh and the protesters were English, so you got a sort of loggerhead situation, which was, which was a culture clash, really, uh, more than anything else, I think. So if I could just read you a little section of that. Excuse me. Um, in this scene, two um, Welsh people involved in, in the trade, um, Tom and Betty, are taking a French buyer, uh, a buyer of lambs, to, to lunch. I've done this before. I start reading without putting my reading glasses on. It's a real mistake. Um, are taking a French bar to lunch in a, in, a, in, a, <coughs> in a pub in Wales. In the Merlin, the Frenchman sipped dispiritedly at his bitter and told them about the blonde and radiant beers of Alsace. There was no lamb on the menu, and the steak, when it came, was overcooked. Across the table, Betty beamed, her cheeks bulging as she chopped and shoveled her food. Very hot in France, she said, gulping. Hardly rains at all, they tell me. Am I right? Monsieur Dreyer drawled his fork across the plate with a disheartened gesture, stirring the frozen peas into little heaps. Betty finished her food with hurried, efficient movements. She pushed her plate to one side and picked at her teeth. Tom's newspaper was folded on the table between them. There was a picture on the front page of an Arab, somebody from the Middle East. The Frenchman noticed this and tapped his fingers at it. 
Beaucoup de ces gens-là à Strasbourg qui disaient, les musulmans sont des grands consommateurs de moutons. Vous permettez He picked up the newspaper and rustled through it. Tom heard him give a little grunt of surprise or interest as he shook and rattled the paper into a manageable size, showing them the page that had caught his attention. Ça veut dire quoi, ça? It was a, a half-page advertisement, the same bloody one that Farm Concern had used before, showing a bedraggled lamb streaked with shit, hunched miserably in the corner of some broken-down stock wagon. There'd been an injunction taken out on the use of this image a couple of months ago. The thing was bogus. It wasn't an export lorry. A setup like that would never have got past the ministry or trading standards. But here it was again. Presumably, farm concern would just pay the fine. They would welcome the fuss. The same caption, caption over the picture. First soak in urine and excrement, then roast with garlic and herbs. Clever, venomous language, unconcerned with truth or fairness. Tom hadn't noticed before the subtle appeal to xenophobia in the reference to garlic the distasteful subtext, subtext of foreigners and their malodorous and gluttonous eating habits. Farm Concern had spent their money well. Some advertising hack would be well pleased, some cynical bastard with a farmhouse in the Dordogne and a firm grip on the tabloid imagination. Of course, it was the sight of the lambs on the lorries that really did it. When the big wagons joined the queues of cars and caravans waiting to get on the ferry, when the children pressed sticky hands against the windows, look, mum, look at all those sheep, dad, the sight triggered that latent English distaste for food and the enjoyment of eating, which is one of the things they hold against Europe in general, <laughs> and the French in particular. That sensual culture where a leg of lamb is a gigot, the word itself plump and running with juices. It was just too obvious where the lambs were going and what was intended for them, not only to be eaten, but to be eaten by foreigners. The mawkish idyll of the countryside swept away, Tom thought about the power of the food scares, pasturella, salmonella, beguiling names that sounded like the limpid and underage heroines of Chuck Berry songs. <laughs> the food scares fitted comfortably into the notion that food and eating is essentially polluting, cloacal, never far from the whiff of the toilet. The movement against live exports produced a fatal fusion between sentimentality and that low-grade xenophobia that is never far below the surface in the English psyche a dull and petulant hatred of the whole world, but especially of Europe. People talk about Ireland's deadly affair with history, the gloomy steeples of Fermanagh and Tyrone, but really it is England that has the dismal and corrupting preoccupation with the past. Sometimes you feel the whole country has gone moth-eaten with regret for the moment, whenever it was, when the world jilted her, gone rancid, eaten up with self-pity and vainglory. This side of the seven you get just as much introversion, Tom thought, but it is vague misty, ignorant, benign. The waitress cleared away their plates. She was a big girl. As she leaned over the table between them, her white shirt stretched tight and opened winking portholes between the buttons. Monsieur Drea glanced gratefully up at her as her blouse brushed his cheek, turning his face towards her as reflexively as a baby. <laughs> Thank you very much for that, uh, Chris. Uh, and uh, I just like I said that we're, we're going to have a, a brief a Q and A session. So if anybody has any questions, now is the time to to ask them. And then you'll have the opportunity to buy numerous books, of course, from our bookstall at the back of the uh, at the back of the room, uh, signed by the authors, um, of course. Uh, so, does anybody have any questions for any of our panelists? Okay, John. Well, I've kind of a. Comment, I think when you were talking about how you have to explain what what was going on in Wales, I, I noticed that in Sharon K. Penman too, when she does books about Wales. And I think you know, when you're writing for an American audience and maybe other countries, I think that explanation has to be there. Um, but it's good for us to read Welsh authors too, because who don't have to, aren't interested in explaining that, they have to talk about being Welsh and what, what's important for Welsh people. So I think we have to have courses that maybe bring both kinds of presentations to Americans who want to learn more and know more. Both of those aspects are important for us to know about Wales more. That is more of a comment than a question. Mm. 
Does anybody? Yes, sorry. Yeah. I have a, a comment as well. I have a question. I just want to express gratitude. I, I'm a sociology professor, and we're coming into Cultural Diversity Week, and I, I was so. I'm Welsh. <laughs> I mean, like 50 percent Welsh, but I'm so naive to all of these things because it's just so far removed from my ancestry. So it's it's actually going to reshape my classes. So I mean, really, the scale of what it means to to think about multiculturalism and ethnocentrism through another lens. So thank you, all of you. Any other questions? I was kind of struck by uh, all of you bringing out the feeling of identity in a small way and then trying to envision it in a larger way, like Britain with Wales, England, so on, <clears throat> that I've experienced that very much in America. I'm an Oregonian very strong, but, and I've been on the bus with people from the South and not been able to even understand what they were saying. Their, their accent was different. Their, their food is different, their culture is different. But I, I'm fascinated by not becoming part of them, but feeling like I'm part of this larger piece that can come together in crisis, that can come together through entertainment, which I find very entertaining to, to read the Welsh literature uh, and then struck by it. And, uh, Recently, I've been getting into the Scandinavian literature and finding those differences between Denmark, Sweden, Norway, and so forth, and Finland. And, and I love the idiom. I love that unique difference in each of those areas. I find it enriches my life, uh, even though I very much myself, I can connect with this otherness, and I really embrace it. So, I would like to see courses on Welsh literature because I could really get into it in depth, but perhaps not lose that that larger picture of if it's within the university, it's within, within the humanity part, maybe and we've got the British literature, and the Irish literature, and so forth, and then being able to get those people together through anthologies, perhaps, to uh, coming together like this. Um, so, I would argue for both. Thank you. And uh, was the uh, lady at the back? I think. Uh, uh, you know, I I'm from Portland, and um, I don't know if people know much about the soft community here, but it's quite large. And one of the many very popular camps for youth is called UK Camps. And what happens is they bring in soccer players, who are probably from lower level leagues, to work for the summer. They stay with soccer families from the more intensive clubs, and then they host younger children. And um, it was interesting to me because they had a World Cup, and my kids were, as they got into it, doing it after a large a year, um, they were told, we'll each represent a country. And so they came home and they said, we want to make a flag for our country. And so one of them said, well, I'm England. And I said, do you mean the Great Britain flag? And I pulled it up on the internet, and she said, no, the white and red flag. Oh, well, that was interesting. And then my daughter comes up and says, and I'm with Wales. So, of course, that was really exciting to cut that whole uh, thing out of the But anyway, um, I just thought it was interesting because these soccer players, were, they're a lot of fun, high energy, but they aren't really very political. They're really all about the sport, getting the kids involved, and that they had gone ahead and made that distinction that sort of echoed what you were saying, that they specifically, the other countries were like specific countries, like France or Poland or, uh, you know, Chile or whatever, and then there was England and Wales and Scotland, all separate, so. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Just, okay, so. Yes, um, I was born in Crosskeys, Monmouthshire. It was Monmouthshire back then. But we moved to Somerset when the pit dried up. And uh, that was dreadful because my mom was all loud and, you know, Welsh and we had to be very proper. And uh, <laughs> we were also called the Didikai. I don't know if you're familiar with Didikai. It's, uh, it's a term they use in Gloucestershire for people who are part gypsy. Yeah, yeah, we use it in Merthyr, Did you guys? Yeah. Yeah, so yeah, I am familiar with it, yeah. So we yeah. had that kind of prejudice right. against yeah. us too. Yeah. Um, but my question is, going back, when I would go to North Wales and they would speak Welsh, but they would speak English with a Liverpool accent, 
and, and you know, I'm wondering, because you live there now, is there any difference between the people in South Wales and North Wales as far as? Uh, I think there's a great affinity. Uh, I mean, I've I've, do, I've I've done lots of readings and tours in North Wales, and uh, especially in the in the slate mining areas, you know, Blenheim, Stiniog, and Thester, all around there. Tremendous affinity between people there and, and the, the mining valleys, you know, because uh, you know we've had a industry which has completely a, abandoned us, you know, and then same with them, you know. So we're we, we're left neglected and abandoned, you know. It's colonialism, really. Um, when it comes down to it, you know, that, that's why, you know, I go along with Edie. I, I don't accept that Welsh literature should, it has any place in, in Britain or British literature at all. We should, you know, we should be a completely separate entity, in my view. Same as Edie, same as Irish literature. Okay, uh, we've got time for one further question. Yes, next year, uh, 2014, centennial of the beginning of World War One, And so there'll be some activities, I understand, regarding war poets including David Jones, who perhaps you uh, at the university may teach about. And I understand the Welsh National Opera is working on one of his works to present in the opera in a year or two, or maybe three. But anyway, what do you have to say about David Jones, English or Welsh? Who is he, and what do you have to say about him? I'm not, a, I'm not a great expert on David Jones, but I will say that Alan Lewis uh, is one of the finest poets of the Second World War. Uh, so you know, a, a Welshman who, uh, you know, grew up in Aberdeer, went to uh, Burma, fought in Burma and India, and uh, his, his poetry, I think, is, uh, you know, had a major influence on, on a lot of writers in a way. So David Jones, I, I'm not definitely not an interesting modernist poet, you know, artist as well, but uh, obviously he, he, would, he drew a great deal on the mythology, of, you know, of Wales, so. Yes, ex absolutely, yeah, yeah. I'm not a, I'm not a massive fan of his, as you can gather, but uh, just a plug for Alan Lewis anyway. Can I say just one thing, Kerry? For sure. Some, uh, one other comment. Mm -hmm. You said about, you know, perhaps not being introverted and looking out globally. I think, I think that's really important for any, any country, and any, any nation, but I think you can only do that if, if you are true to yourself and, and you have your own strong sense of identity of who you are. Um, and I think one of the, one, uh, Plus, I shouldn't say this, but I, I think there are a large degree in our society today that um, uh, capitalism has emasculated democracy, you know, and I think still think within mining communities and development and communities in Wales that there is a strong sense of social conscience. Um, and I think that's, that's something we should... Um, uh, some people ask me, you know, when I, I wrote this thing for this Christmas card, why did I set it in America? But well, they said to me, it was obvious. Dickens wrote when it was in London, and London was empire. Whether you like it or not, America is now empire. It is, it is the superpower. It's been at the heart of a lot of things that are going on. And I just wondered, because I think as Welsh people, we have an affinity with people like Dickens, who were writing at the time, who were writing about issues, that, you know, a prostitution he was writing out, he was about child abuse, things that weren't, were suppressed. So, you know, I was wondering what kind of things you'd write about today. I'm sure you'd write about AIDS. I'm sure you'd write about the way soldiers are treated when they come back from Afghanistan, how, how cynical we are in the way we deploy our, and use our young people, all these kind of things, you know. So I think it's important that, you know, Portland, anywhere, really, because you state, you are a country, basically, aren't you, you know, compared to us, uh, you're a state, you, that you have this strong sense of identity, and Kerry said you've you're, you're got a very um, liberal view, and I think that's great, you know, it's great, you've got to have that sense of identity before you can connect, before you can influence other people, and I just, I just think that was a very, very important and telling point that you made. Sorry. Uh, no, that's what okay, well, uh, I'll just wrap up by thanking our panelists, uh, uh, Dr. Tracy Prince, Sarah Woodbury, uh, Phil Jenkins, uh, sorry, Phil Rollins, Mike Jenkins. <laughs> we morphed. <laughs> <laughs> I just can't get names right so I need to be a uh, And Chris Kyle, and uh, all of you, of course, for attending. And uh, I'd like to invite you to join us at the back of the room at the bookstore and uh, snap up copies of, uh, or signed copies of our author's books while they're still hot. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen.